game! Wait, Princess Sparkle Muffin, some people might think that this game only has white, straight, cisgender, playable characters, making them outraged! We haven't even gotten to the gameplay description and already this is off the rails! I can't believe I'm going to say this, but... Dear God! will be a comedy-driven, turn-based, JRPG-style PC game with inspirations from The Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy III, and classic adventure games like Monkey Island and Quest for Glory. So, what happens in this game? Stuff like this! Hello, everyone. I am so sorry. I was having audio issues. I couldn't. At first, my mic was acting up, and then I couldn't hear anyone. So I apologize for being so late. But today we have with us special guest Liana, and she is doing a Kickstarter with Mary Jess. We also have Bianca. How are you guys doing today? Start with Liana. How are you? All right. Well, we're finally on. That was that was a comedy of errors. The audio gods were not were not kind to us. <laughs> poor poor Mary Jess. He's like an audio guy. He's a music guy. And he's going. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Mary Jess. You're you're new to me. Well, um, I guess you could say I'm a trained opera singer, and uh, I'm also a, uh, an artist, graphic designer, and I'm originally from Ecuador, um, of all places. <laughs> Oh, awesome. And I, I think everyone knows Bianca, but <laughs> Bianca, how are you? Bianca. Hi. How are you guys? I'm good. Thank you. Peace and thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So what we're going to talk about, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into other subjects, but first I want to talk about the little video that played in the beginning, and that has to do with Liana's Kickstarter, which is... Was that me or no? <laughs> oh, okay, we lost Tristan Not again. again. <laughs> oh no! Uh oh. Whoa! Can you hear me? Oh, she's back. Okay, good. And she's gone again. Yeah, this is the issue we were having before the stream, guys. This is why we were late. The sound goblins kidnap people. Yeah, Tristan's <laughs> mic keeps. Oh. Oh, oh no! We've lost her. Lost where, completely. Oh, where, where are you? I give restream credit. The host <laughs> just dropped out, and the stream <laughs> continues. But yeah, this is this is what was happening. Oh, Tristan's back. Kind of, I think. It, working? Oh, uh, you're back. You. Uh, I said credit to restream. The host like dropped out. The stream continued. I know. I love it. Um, the one time when me and Bianca <laughs> were actually streaming, we got, it was in the morning stream and in my, I, I lost Wi-Fi completely. Like, thanks. Awesome. 
uh, per, to an awesome provider. And it went out completely. And Bianca's, Bianca's just sitting here, like, keeping the stream happy, keeping it going. I'm like, you are truly a trooper when it comes to it. I love it. Just talking yeah. about animus. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what's going on on the internet right now that things keep taking a crap. I know. I, gotta... It's just, it was doing this to me yesterday. I, I had a birthday stream and it was just a mess. Anytime I would share anything, I would cut out. So I'm going to have to go through my computer and see what's going on. But back to what we were talking about. Tell us a little bit about your Kickstarter. Yeah, we're, uh, Mary Jess and I are making a game called, based on the Boss Fight web series that, you know, I've been on the stream. You're nice enough to have me come on and talk about that. Uh, but it's a, uh, as the video said, it's a classic turn based JRPG with a lot of adventure game elements. And it's based on kind of little meta story that went on with uh, a boss fight with, you know, a fairy tale princess uh, becomes the heroine of her own story. And she's got this band of misfit, lovable oddballs and a poop throwing soul eating unicorn. And it, it starts off with a really simple story, a really simple quest to rescue her, her childhood nanny, her beloved childhood nanny. And it, it just, goes from there and much like the um uh uh adventure games that it's based on there's a lot of you know fairy tale tropes pirate tropes all that stuff like all over the place but it's very satirical um it's like a lot of that old very kind of soft humor but then there's a satirical edge i think we're trying not to be mean but we're pointed was that said about right, Mary Jess? Like we're not mean, we're just pointed. <laughs> I'd say, I'd say so. Um, I guess we always hew to the uh, Carol Channing um, rule of parody, which is to never be malicious uh, yeah. and to have a little bit of affection for the subject you're parodying, but you don't need to dip uh, to dip into the uh, mean spirited and mean heartedness. Yeah, I mean that that's definitely a holdover from Boss Fight. Um, go it like skewering the pop culture phenomenon surrounding a person and attacking the person as a person to me are extremely different things and that's the line between sort of laugh with and like mean mock i i don't i don't like having having been a youtuber for long enough i don't like savagely going after people it's not fun oh i totally get it um i got a i got a, a, a super chat from Dr. Soup, if you guys get a chance, check out her channel. She's awesome. Amber Heard took my Wi-Fi down. Yep. She found out where I live. And yeah, that that, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, but you're also doing these, like, what I thought was super cool was you can be an NPC. You can have a pet. Like, what what brought you to do so to have that idea? Oh, uh, Mary Just and I have worked on quite a few crowdfunds, you know, organizers, consultants together. And mm -hmm. two main things inspired this approach to crowdfunding. One was the fact that when you do these, these in-game asset incentives, like you can have your portrait in a game or, you know, you get your name on a tombstone. All this gets implemented in the last year to two years of development. And it is a sinkhole. The scope creep, the feature creep, just get it's not even a feature it's just asset implementation grind so we're we thought about it there's nothing in the kickstarter rules is you can't do it this way so like why has nobody done it this way the other thing is that being in a in a game is cool um the problem with a lot of these be in a video game have your character in a video game is it's it's a few hundred dollars Right. right. Just for a basic stand there, get a picture in the game or something. It doesn't actually cost that. That's the add on of, you know, the, the big Kickstarter tiers of you get a copy of the game and the art book and your name in the credits and all these, all these, all these incentives. And we thought, let's open it up to people so that the people who are really excited about it can be part of it for a fairly affordable price instead of it just being people who have a couple hundred dollars to blow and then wait two years for anything to happen. Right. So that, that was the thinking behind it. And then of course, a Patreon member said, can we have a pet instead of us? That's where the pets came from. 
I love that. That's the idea I love. So you definitely have a hush or a bane. And <laughs> I, I'm like, I can't decide who. Don't tell the other one. <laughs> I love it. I love that idea. I was going to ask next where that came from. Yeah, I that, do. That, that's where it is. It's just somebody said, I had a thing where people could put their pets, um, pet photos on set in Boss Fight. And so someone asked, are we going to do the same thing? And I was like, why not? do the same thing why why can't we uh uh have people's because can you pet the dog is a meme right and mary just is a bit crazy and every time i ask him can we do something he says of course <laughs> i well, i thought it would be a great idea to just say you know not only can you pet the dog in this game you can also be the dog <laughs> I love it. Well, well, yeah, we are very furry friendly, as you can as you can tell by Mary Jess Icon. Uh, we don't believe it is truly an inclusive experience unless you're you're pro furry. Furries spend money. We like furries. <laughs> I actually have a question for you, Liana, um, mm -hmm. from Robert. He says, um, Liana, had the vans made a different story selection, like Sparkle Muffin going bad, among others? Would the game have come about? Was it always planned? Oh, that's a bit of a complicated question. One of the <laughs> things the Kickstarter backers got was a video that went through all the different alternate endings of the boss fight series. There was an ending where a uh, Princess Sparkle Muffin became a capitalist mogul with Anne Reardon from episode two. Um, there was an ending where everybody died. Uh, there were a bunch <laughs> of different endings based on the voting. The one I thought was the least likely to happen is status quo totally maintained. And that was the one that people voted for. And so I was like, okay. Um, the original idea when, because much like the boss fight game, a, a few select people got a chance to write character backstories for the boss fight video series. And when they did those characters, we actually had them fill out pen and paper RPG sheets, uh, you know, like the, the Dungeons and Dragons character sheets for stats for the various characters. Of course, what we got back was cool and uh, made a, uh, you know, it was, it was an interesting exercise and it made things very clear, but of course you put all those characters together. It was incredibly unbalanced. And, uh, very just as a whiz with RPG maker. And so it was just the, the fastest way to do what we wanted. We, you know, looked at some other engines, but we thought that classic JRPG look, um, the, the game has evolved since that alpha footage. That's why we put the alpha footage tag on. Uh, the battlers are going to be much more high high resolution in the finished version more of like um i don't know what would you say more of a chrono trigger look mary jess than that well, straight up classic final fantasy on this uh, because of their size i would say yeah. it's closer to um uh fantasy star fantasy um, star oh, there you go, it's, yeah. it's, it, they're, it, you you're not looking at them from the back they're they're side view battlers but they're taller um, yeah. than what we originally were going for. So uh, we originally had the, the Final Fantasy look, the chibi style, both in the world map and in the battlers. Uh, but then um, we expanded the resolution. And at that moment, I went, you know, now that we have the, uh, the screen real estate, we can afford to to have larger battlers. And of course I say that uh, all excited. And then I looked at the battler sheets and go, I'm gonna have to make every single one of them again. Every, yep. every single one of those poses. Yeah, but it, it also gives kind of a cool zoom in effect that we weren't getting. Um, of course, all the, all the cities and everything scaled on the big map, but the characters didn't. And it would have worked fine, but we, without getting massive scope creep you can tell i'm a producer right you are going to hear scope creep and feature creep come out of me so much as something to be avoided like the plague uh it's it's a thing in game dev but without massive feature creep we're going to try to create the highest quality um silly poop and fart jokes funny fairy tale princess game with furries and an eclectic cast we possibly can Yes, when ga gamers get eaten by Gru's, game devs get eaten by feature creep. 
Yeah. Do, do, does the chat know what feature creep is? Sometimes people don't know this term. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. Feature creep or scope creep is when basically it's what happened, I think, to Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, it eats games. You want to do all the things and there's nobody going, no guys, we're going to save it for the sequel. We have to make the best game we can with what we have now we have to ship in two years. And so the scope and the size of this thing just balloons and balloons and balloons. And we, Mary, Justin, and I both worked on projects that, that sometimes games don't even come out because the creeps get so bad or they ship broken or they're just a scattered mess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, we're, we're trying to be really disciplined that way, but not chuck out the good hard. ideas. Yeah. It's hard because we we both get excited and go, this is a really good idea. And that is how a simple ditty for the ending of the Boss Fight web series became a four-character uh, Stephen Sondheim musical-style ending. Okay, but <laughs> even that was, I want to say three weeks. It might have been more like five from concept something to finish like, yeah, something it, like five it, it didn't sprawl on for months so it was if we can do it in five weeks fantastic uh, if we can't we'll go back to basically twinkle twinkle little star or something <laughs> like that it uh we kind of push each other in that regard mary just pushes me more than i push him i think in that regard uh but uh yeah i i've been a producer for my entire media career and so it's kind of drilled into me that i'm the person who goes no we can't do it now i'm okay being the meanie <laughs> uh, I, i'm okay with that because it it you don't want to burn out your staff right everybody wants to make a really cool game the nice thing about using retro graphics is your system resources are really forgiving because of the style we chose the the animation is a uh, challenge because everything has to be you know frame by frame it's it's frame animation that that's the work there but once that's all down you know we're we're good it's not going to be this massive you need a you know a 3000 series in video graphics card to run it yes and pixel art ages so well um, yes when it you look at it so well too it scales so well too i mean if you look at some of the early P, uh, playstation games when you had the uh the incredibly polygonal uh people uh versus say some of the golden age of adventure games you know the quest for glory games uh, mm -hmm. or the lucas arts games that pixel art still looks gorgeous whereas the games in the in in the PlayStation era and the Nintendo sixty four were great, but then you look back and go, "Oh boy, those those polygons did not age well at all." What's going <laughs> right. on with her face? Yeah, es especially on non uh, cathode ray tube TVs. I have to say cathode ray tube now because CRT is something different, and I feel oh old yeah, scared. yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, I yes. just got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I did CRT TV, and people were like what? I did get Robert saying it gives them uh, Z Boyd Cthulhu saves Christmas vibes, and then I got a question: uh, Can you get some feature creepers <laughs> as enemies? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. Yes, feature creepers. There's a place in the game that that would make sense. Yes, that, that I know exactly where. Yep. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the characters. I mean, I know, I I, I guess it, a lot of some of this is already going to be well known, but let's go in like we don't know anything about these characters. Right. Uh, somebody in chat asked what, you know, what's the motivation for, for the characters? Mm -hmm. this, this is a game where it's about good guys win. It's about friendship and kindness and that, that, that stuff. However, the twist for us in terms of, of morality. And, and I will not go down the rabbit hole into discussing <laughs> how video game morality has barely changed since Ultima 4. Mm -hmm. But uh, the twist is that what's considered good and kind to you know a sheltered fairy tale princess is not gonna be the same as a succubus is not going to be the same as a you know an, an ancient warrior is not going to be the same as a wolf man from space right so it, it's an examination of in a very fun way 
different ways to be good and how they can have overlap, how they can conflict at times. I mean, obviously what a succubus thinks is good is, is not going to be the classic D and D uh, priest of helm, lawful, good alignment. So that I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing that element. Cause that's been an issue I've had with fantasy games for so very, very long. Mm -hmm. I like that. Like the subjectivity of being good and being kind and what it means to different people. Right. Is that what you mean? Yeah. And obviously there are certain things. Don't be cruel. Like don't be knowingly cruel. Right. right. There, there are certain things that, that we recognize. Yeah. That's just bad. If you are mean uh, and you know, you're being mean and you're deliberately being a jerk, that is, uh, that is not cool. Now there are some very, very snarky characters in the game, but Mouse, the uh, the cat man in the game, snarks for for people's best interests. He cares. There, there. Therefore, he he scratches sometimes. Uh, <laughs> he's and, kind and of a also, benevolent pull lint. Yeah, he he's sort of uh, we when we talk about in writing, we separate uh, Armand, the the space wolf. Uh, is a big bushy waggy waggy tail and mouse is a flicky tail um, in terms of, of dialogue and reactions to things but you know you also get into people's backgrounds and traumas and what happened to them and and the whole golden rule is a very subjective thing you know that do unto others as you would have done unto you um, obviously that's very different for different people based on where they come from Mm -hmm. Right. And and one thing that's super great, somebody would consider incredibly considerate to one person is, Ack, get out of my space. You're smothering me to someone else. Mm -hmm. And we, we really want to explore that. What's the point of a role playing game if you can't role play? It's not just battle level grinding. There's actually got to be some story. And that's where the adventure game elements come into it there's a, a lot of places that you don't have to do the battles you can do puzzles or a social solution or something like that instead because one of the things some people don't like about jrp style jrpg style games is the combat grinding so there's going to be options i love it i like it a lot this is a perfect comment um song I believe song W Ethan. Yeah. It's almost like our backgrounds influence our personalities. You can't separate them. That's exactly right. And that's exactly kind of what it seems like you mean when it comes to the different type of characters and how you're going to develop them or how they've already been developed. Now, how many different characters um, are you having in the game? Now I, I'm not talking NPCs. I mean, main characters. Uh -huh. 10, well, 10 playable characters in parties of four. Okay. But then characters from Boss Fight like Anne Reardon, Shao Kind, uh, Rahul Henchman, uh, I'm forgetting some others, but they're uh, the Sorcerer Zarkazan, they're going to be shopkeeps and other characters in the game as well. But the characters you see on the crowdfunding page, that's the 10 playable characters. We pick them for uh, play style as much as anything else. When you look at them, you can kind of see, yeah, okay, I kind of see how that character would play. Uh, we wanted some variety in that regard, but we also wanted a, a bunch of personalities as well. Uh, right. Not, not just, Hey, this person hits really hard and this person uses pew pew bow and arrow. Right. We wanted to <laughs> also create characters that we, I think mouse, we, we, uh, sorry, Mary just <laughs> most is the game character. I'm looking at the cat. <laughs> um, I, I think we kind of went anti bioware in that Bioware <laughs> characters tend to start as cliches and go, you know, uh, kind of peel back like an onion. Whereas we more went, yes, the fairy tale princess thing, but let's challenge the cliche right off the bat. So let's have the, you know, the mixed race guy be the nobleman who uses mm -hmm. a bow and arrow, right? Let's um, have the warrior guy be the sidekick and come at things sideways. Let's make the cutesy poo unicorn huck poo at people <laughs> and, and immediately challenge those 
tropes mm -hmm. instead of saying the trope is inherently bad. And I know I'm right. going into a little bit of dicey territory there, but we, we all love fairy tale tropes, right? right. I mean, everybody grows up. There's a Disney song you love. I don't care what anybody says. Everybody has one Disney song. Like more than one. Or, 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 or all or the Disney ten. songs. Yeah. Or, or 75. There you go. <laughs> Probably more. We all love that stuff, right? I mean, Mary Poppins basically turned me into an opera singer. <laughs> oh, there you go. And that's I mean, funny yeah. because I love Sleeping Beauty because the singer who uh, plays Aurora is an opera singer. <laughs> yes. Well, that'd that be prepared in the chat. Yeah, I mean, everybody's got something and we, we don't want to go, oh, no, we're reinventing the wheel. And, and I think we're also both kind of sick of the grimdark, yeah. right? Right. Oh, God, yes, I'm so tired of that. <laughs> we're, oh. we're both big Terry Pratchett fans. Yes. The name of Princess Sparkle Muffin's nanny should be a dead giveaway for that. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's, it's a risque, it's Nanny Netherwax instead of Granny Weatherwax, <laughs> but we're, uh, we're big fans of Terry Pratchett. And the wonderful thing about Terry Pratchett is it was such scathing social commentary in this wonderful, bubbly, colorful, friendly veneer. And he also, this is the, the thing that I like the most about Terry Pratchett and a lot of people who dismiss him fail to, to, to notice. Terry Pratchett had the ability to create satire and to create commentary, but at the very end of the day, he was very much a benevolent figure. Mm -hmm. um, even when he is pointing out the foibles of his characters, there is always an element even if the character is an absolute horrible person, there is, for example, he will have an element uh, as a narrator of sadness that this person mm -hmm. went this way. And if when you have characters who are midway, you know, that they're flawed characters, they're doing some wrong things, but they want to do better, there is this, this element of compassion towards them, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that Granny Weatherwax has, even if she doesn't outwardly show it. And that's something. That's another thing we wanted to to tack on because you know we had the, the the spectrum of you know being a jerk being a mean you know all of the things but we also are looking into something that terry pratchett and to a point uh stephen sondheim uh pointed out that nice being nice is different from being good yeah 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 and and yes. obviously <laughs> boss fight went right to the heart of that the evil criminal organization was called nice nice yeah noise Noise. <laughs> noise. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, nice is just telling people what they want to hear, right? And yes. that's yes. not always the good thing to do. That's not always the kind thing to do. And um and uh yeah, I mean someone someone mentioned solemnity in, in the chat, and that's a very interesting choice of words, and that's really good feedback. That's part of the cool things we've done doing these streams is we get feedback right now of what people want. Mm -hmm. uh and that's really useful yeah there it is and yeah. I, I i definitely think there's some of that in in this i mean i think to uh mary just just discovered biff the understudy from the Baldur's gate caves recently <laughs> and i was like what i have a i i played through the original Baldur's Gate so many times and then I played through Baldur's Gate 2 so many times and what's so inspiring about those games is they were only partially voiced and no no cinematic cutscenes nothing it was just picking moments and there were moments that were incredibly touching uh how familiar are you guys with the um the the series with uh, the the different playable characters there's this one um elf named airy she's a a winged elf really, a fairly obscure um subclass but uh yeah she got she got her wings cut off and this is way before lucifer the tv show did it but she had her wings cut off and it was this whole thing of dealing with the idea that she's this winged elf who's grounded and i uh, had to kind of find a way forward and it's just it's all voice acting in a portrait 
and it's one of those things you realize after playing the game for the fourth time these portraits don't move but i believe it i'm seeing facial expressions that aren't there in these portraits right and uh there's a real art there's a real art to a good portrait which is why we're doing the little character studies that we're releasing on on twitter and the facebook group and and stuff like that and that that's another thing about the the chat one kind of like really popped on the whole grimdark thing and the issue with grimdark for me and i wonder if mary just agrees and i wonder if you know tristan and bianca agree it's not so much that there's an issue with going dark i love me my gritty stuff the problem is if you do it wrong there's nowhere to go you need light and shadow you need color and contrast get a school there you yeah. go uh and if you don't have the light you can't have the dark mean anything mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's yeah it's the it's one yeah. of the prints like one of the, my favorite principles in opera a very well done opera uh will have the tragedy be cathartic because there will be at least some element of hope in it as opposed to well wagner is exhausting so i'm not going to bring him up <laughs> Uh, I mean, if you if you could if you can last through one Wagner opera, you deserve a medal. But, <laughs> <laughs> but for example, if you look at Tosca, for example, even though uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a story about authoritarianism and and corruption, but at the very end, you know, you have the this woman Tosca, an opera singer, who stabs the man who killed her boyfriend to death. And she goes, be before him trembled all of Rome. Davante lui tremava tutta Roma. And then she gets chased by the uh, by by the guards, you know, because they've just discovered the body. Uh, and she has this majestic moment when she just stands on the parapet and turns back to them and goes, Scarpia davanti Deo. It's like Scarpia, I will see you before God. Then she turns and she jumps off the parapet into the abyss to her death because she will not be taken alive she will die on her own terms and she absolutely defied everybody and just left a mess behind her and she doesn't care uh and you of course the audience is in tears but you go they go good for you girl good for you right <laughs> i actually do have a question for you uh from incubus so is it going to be like advanced dungeon dragons only super girly with pegasus unicorn fairy amazons and mermaid is character classes with Shrek esque double entendres. Uh, if the super girly elements come from Mary Jest, I have I struggle <laughs> with, with super girly. Uh, that that was sort of the funny thing of me going. Princess Sparkle Muffin was supposed to be a one off character that was created to be annoying as a foil for the character I super loved, which was the evil queen in Lady Bits episode 12, <laughs> the, the previous series that did the boss fight. But people love this Princess Peach pastiche. And so I'm like, all right, we'll run with this. My heart is still with the evil queen. <laughs> but we're gonna get to that. But okay, there's this thing in video games of people saying, we wanna see the damsel in distress rescue herself, right? <laughs> but then you get into what that means. And the, the cheap out tends to be she inexplicably learns to fight and becomes some sort of ass kicker, right? Instead of y y figuring out how to make a fairy tale princess who sings songs and befriends animals and is just really, really nice and kind and sweet to everybody, make that interesting and make that its own form of heroism. And that's where the idea came from. And that was where the idea of making Princess Sparkle Muffin as the main character, the party healer came from. Um, that's a bit of my, um, my D and D background as well. I like playing healers. It's, in, in in tabletop you can reward healers but you know playing world of warcraft healers got shaft in terms oh, yeah. of xp right you're keeping the party on the feet but you you don't get xp for that and i'm like power to clerics man uh let's make this interesting let's separate the religiosity from the healing factor 
and create a main character because let's, let's face it when you're picking your your character loadout i know i'm jumping all over the place because this is kind of a deep dive in terms of design but when you're picking your character loadout in a four to six um character roster you have to have fighter mage rogue cleric right because you need a complete party so you end up picking characters based on what you need them to do in battle instead of it being fun so we made it we gave the player more real choice by going okay you're gonna have a, a healer in your party no matter what you do so now you can just pick the characters you like to play instead of needing a healer does mm -hmm. that make sense oh yeah um okay. it and it goes back a uh, well robert thing in my opinion um part of why they the love for her is because it goes back to your original argument with anita about damsel in distress and it personifies things. Do you think that has a lot to do with it? Um, I think people, maybe. Uh, it's really tough to talk about why. Uh, Mary just might be better talking about this. Because it's really hard to talk about why characters like a character I created. I'm surprised <laughs> whenever anyone connects. I was sure I was going to get canceled off the planet and then canceled off of mars and then canceled out of the universe and i would have to become some female version of dr manhattan making things on a distant universe for making a trans man sidekick warrior i was sure people on all sides were just gonna freak the fuck out at that character but people freaking love solomon well, and it's because he has that the the thing I think the the reason people love your characters is then sure prima facie when they look at the picture they'll go oh this is a stereotype but they're not like you say you don't um, you go ahead and make them interesting you give them a reason for being they're not just you know the princess they're not just a sidekick they have a, like social justice story of course his backstory is has elements of hilarity like the golden girls and nana muscuri cds <laughs> <laughs> uh i can identify um, <laughs> but it, it also has it also has all of that story about being gaslit about being used about being used by someone as a tool instead of a mean of instead of an end in itself as a means to an end and then feeling as an left as an outcast feeling rejected um and in many ways, that was kind of incubating there from the first appearances of the social justice warrior. And um, people kind of see that. they There is something in how you portray these characters that telegraphs, you know, there is a lot more under the surface. Uh, and we're going to get to see that. And so, the, and we're going to get to see that in the game too. Now, now you have more than just, you know, the 27, 37 minutes to tell a story. Now we've yeah. got the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 God, how <laughs> our game uh, that where where these stories can be told at length, and the player can have an input in how some of these stories resolve. Yeah, that's the part I'm excited out of extrapolating from the boss fight voter choice thing, mm -hmm. letting people have their own individualized experiences. So if they really want to see that different arc, uh, they can um and i think the challenge is going to be there making the characters stay true to who they are but providing some um branching um and then and then i i don't know about you guys but with me in rpgs i much prefer sort of the yakuza style open world thing of not every encounter you have is bracing and life-changing <laughs> yes. sometimes they're just funny things that happened <laughs> So we've sort of embraced that of not everything is going to change the arc of the character's destiny. Some stuff's just going to be really fun and you can horribly fail out of it and still win. Right. And you have the tiers where people can actually write stories, right? Yeah. Those are gone. Uh, oh, okay. But, those are gone. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, but those, those, I, we knew those would go quick. There is an opportunity for people to be a quest giver NPC, meaning they actually get a portrait instead of just the dialogue, uh, the, the the avatar, and they get some dialogue and they actually get to go, I want a quest that does this, right? And we'll go and, and make it 
with with some involvement for them. We limited the number of writers more than Boss Fight because there's only so many people I want walking around with spoiler lore, right? Right. For obvious reasons, everybody's going to have to sign an NDA on that one because mm -hmm. there are going to be times where they're going to write something. We're like, no, you can't do that because it's, it's not released to the public, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there, there's that. People, people can even, um, if they got the money, design their own sub boss for the game. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about next. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Well, there are parts in the game where we've sort of designed this dungeon and go, we want a sub boss here. What is it? <laughs> so <laughs> let's just open it up to people. Because let's face it, some of those mid dungeon bosses are the best ones are kind of anachronistic and weird and come out of nowhere. And it's just a moment. And then, it, you know, it it's uh, it's done. Uh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was sort of the exp uh, inspiration for that for me. Yes, oh, you gosh. know that you know that four character. I'm really dating myself here. Four <laughs> character uh, side scroller beat 'em up turtles game. Mm -hmm. The one, where, the one you got to play is that you could pick your turtle. And, yes. Yeah, and I was always Donatello or Leonardo because that's well. Donatello had the best reach. He did, but he was kind of slow. I, I went back and forth. I'm, I'm, I'm not good at picking a single main, um, except for Horny on Main, the base camp in, <laughs> in in Saga Sparkle Muffin. That is the base camp. It is a bar run by Beelzebub. So it has a devil lady uh, doing a little can-can, and it's called Horny on Main. The full name is Horny on Main Entertainment, short form for home. Um <laughs> I thought that was very clever, but uh, the first time I encountered, uh, was it Bebop or was it Rocksteady and Bebop, a dual fight? It was just, I was kind of aware of Ninja Turtles and I'd read the comics and I'd seen the show, but something about Rocksteady and Bebop being bosses, it just made me realize how totally messed up those, <laughs> those characters are in such a cool way. And they, they don't, they don't do very much except be a guy, a, a couple of guys. The turtles can beat up and you don't feel bad because they're they're kind of bullies, right? They're also a boar and a rhinoceros, which is awesome, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it doesn't have the 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 menace of Shredder or the um uh you know the the curse you stuff with Krang, but they're just cool. And that was the idea of I don't care how anachronistic these sub bosses are. If one person has always thought this would be really cool to have in a game, I think if one person thought that, somebody else is going to think that. And a lot of other people are going to think that. And part of making a game about friendship and kindness is to bring in other people and kind of give them hugs through the game design process. And if somebody can feel validated by having that character they always wanted to see in a game, in a game that's awesome that's what gaming's about yeah. right like those experiences that don't necessarily make sense why were they onion knights in final fantasy 3 mm -hmm. you know why does kojima do half the kojimas <laughs> <laughs> we can speculate we don't care right um that's something i i think i find has been lost in the west right just putting things in because they're cool i mean has been lost yeah if you look at i mean things like the quest for glory games um had a lot of ana anachronistic humor mm -hmm. um and you didn't go well that breaks setting no it's like you know, oh that was funny um yeah or even 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 when you go through some final fantasy bosses and you know you have a case where you're supplexing a railroad uh <laughs> yeah or, you know, things like, uh, well, you can't do this anymore, but the Batmobile suddenly drives out of a cave in the original King's Quest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. You know, just things sort of happen because... No, no, no. that was an Ultima. That was an Ultima. There I was think. one in uh, King's Quest as well. Oh, I missed it. The the bird's cave. Every so often, the Batmobile, you heard do 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 oh. and this, this Batmobile just drove out. You could do that and not get sued. <laughs> In, in in the eighties in video games because everything was mail order on floppy disks. Yeah, 
But even, you know, even in um, Quest for Glory 3, they had a Sanford and Son uh -huh. homage in uh, the junk dealers in the market. And in one of the Space Quest games, you had CZ Top. Yes. And, and in... You know, Leisure Suit Larry, there was a reference to <laughs> most other Sierra games at one death where you win like the Sierra death workshop yes. kind of thing. And and did those like fourth wall break? Did it, you know, break theme? Sure. Did anybody care? Oh, 95% of people here don't know adventure games. <laughs> I was just gonna show you that. This is this is why we're here to mm -hmm. to because this is the issue in adventure game now is the Jap more people are familiar with Japanese adventure games, which we consider visual novels. Right. 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 I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. 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 We get into a terminology issue here um, because visual novels and adventure games are not the same in Japan, but ignorant Westerners mix them up all the time. Right. But all the time. Yeah. But back in the day, there were these simple puzzle driven stories where you actually like moved around and and um, manipulated inventory. Yeah. Explored environments, stuff like that. A lot of that stuff got bundled into RPGs. Um, and we're sort of pulling back out those adventure elements. The adventure game genre got absorbed into action adventure and then action rpg mm -hmm. with a side of other kind of rpg and so there are elements um of it but I, we want to sort of distill that experience that that as you know like chaos said in chat the the original legend of zelda was almost like a flex point where the two things kind of merged yeah i think and you, and you had the the quest for glory games uh, all four of them five of them blended action rpg mm -hmm. and adventure because yeah. you uh you had the adventure game sections where you had to sol solve puzzles etc then you had combat mm -hmm. uh, and then you also had stat racing for your, your class because you had three classes four later on in the game where um the approach to solving each puzzle was different depending on what class you had uh, if you were, you know, if you were a thief, then of course you had to solve puzzles through stealth. But you know, the 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 fighter would probably just bash through, etc. Yeah. And the uh, the whole concept of the adventure game, as a point, the point and click adventure game, is that you're you there you're in a world with a setting, and there's a challenge, and 99% of the time, the way through that challenge is not violence. You yeah. have to uh, either the characters are the puzzles and you have to figure out the ca characters and you've got to find a way to manipulate uh, the situation to get to, you know, to, to the next section. Or you have to or, or there you have a literal puzzle where you have a, uh, something in the environment, etc., that needs to be manipulated to go through. Uh, Grim Fandango, for example, is one mm -hmm. of the best adventure games ever. Mm -hmm. uh, Loom is a beautiful adventure game where you use music. To manipulate things and then of course you have monkey island which is like i think is the pinnacle of humor adventure and we are drawing from monkey island a lot because god that game that game series was funny at least the first two mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um the i mean player tastes have changed so much since the 90s that what it means to make an adventure game is now completely different because you have mm -hmm. to manage fr frustration tolerance and nobody's going to accept a soft lock anymore, right? People are like, what's a soft lock? A soft lock is just you get stuck and you don't know why and you can't finish the game. You basically have to restore a past save or start all over again. This was people's idea of fun in the early to mid 90s. You can't do that today, right? Nowadays, yeah. Nowadays you have to have, and I think in many ways it's a it's a better design philosophy the early early sierra games the quest the the king's quest games and the early uh the early space quest games kind of made it made it a funny thing that you would die so you could see the different ways that you could die and get the error mm -hmm. messages but <laughs> you know what many people don't realize that that is that they were breaking new ground mm -hmm. um you know, Roberta Williams is in many ways the mother of graphic adventures uh, and many and graphic players, uh, graphic like games. Yeah. Uh, and so they didn't have rules. They didn't have best practices. They were figuring this out as they went along. And of course, a lot of their experiences 
uh, of games as a concept were tied to the arcade. You know, you just had a set number mm -hmm. of lives and you died, you, you know, trial and error. As the industry progressed and you went on to, uh, you know, older, more mature design philosophies, um, you had LucasArts who went, you know, we, let's not punish the player with multiple deaths. Let's make it so that you can't die in this game, in, in our games, but let's try to create puzzles that are intuitive. And, you know, if you think about it just, you know, just a little bit, you can figure out the way around that. Um, of course, later on, you had issues where some adventure games just vanished up their own butts with mm -hmm. uh, incredibly complex puzzles like the Gabriel Knight 3 oh, yeah. puzzle. Um, uh, and so in many ways, that was the the death, the first death of adventure games because they came back later. They they came back in, in force in the 2000s. And if you see the things like, for example, Dave Gilbert is doing with the Watch It Eye games. Shout out to Dave. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the 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 Blackwell Chronicles games, um, the Unavowed games, um, mm -hmm. they have puzzles in them, but they're woven into the story and woven into the character. So you know, you really know how you're going to get through them. You just have to figure out the steps, etc., and you get mm -hmm. a very rewarding experience. But we have to remember that we wouldn't be at that point, like Dave wouldn't be at that point if Sierra hadn't laid the groundwork with you know all of the mistakes and all of their successes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And people have not played them. <laughs> yeah. And you can find most of them on GOG.com for dirt cheap, as well as the Ultima games. The Ultima games are a cornerstone of role playing history. Uh, Richard Garriott, uh, Ultima 4 is one of the most influential games yeah. in the role playing uh, and the entire role playing spectrum. And unfortunately, companies have not picked up on the notion of the ethical choice. They have simplified it and kind of made it a bit of a, a, a surface thing. Paragon like Bio, Renegade, yeah. yeah like, like Bioware does. Um, yeah. But there are a lot of interesting questions to be asked about, you know, what is actually virtue? What is, actu you know, what is ethical behavior? How does that differ from people to people, etc.? Those are questions that have not been asked or really taken up since Ultima 4, people like Scorpia, you know, one of the, one of the early game journalists, and yeah, she was a woman, uh, and she was a superstar game journalist back in the 90s and 80s. Mm -hmm. She saw Ultima 4 and said, this has great potential. This is going to change the industry. And it changed the industry. It just, the industry has just not changed enough. It has not taken up all of the potential uh, ideas that can be explored from that. So, you know, look, guys, go, go guys and girls, go to GOG.com, look up the Ultima games, look up the uh, LucasArts adventure games, look at the Sierra games. Those are foundational games in the mm -hmm. uh, uh, industry history. And many of them are super playable still today. The funny thing is you're talking about this and I'm like, I feel like uncultured swine. I don't know half the games they're talking. I'm like, I I I I heard uh Bioshock. Okay, we're good. I know what we're talking about now. <laughs> well, see, that, that's so bad. The thing is we want to make a game so that people understand these concepts without having to go back and replay dozens and dozens and dozens of adventure games, right? we want to bring back that experience, but have it be modern expectations. Cause I, right. you know, I, I, I can go on at length and how brilliant what Ultima four did was mm -hmm. all, what Richard Gary was trying to do uh, or, or now Richard Gary, Gary Takayu uh, dude is so cool. He took his wife's last name when he got married. Yeah. Uh, but he basically wanted to solve the problem where in Ultima 3, players just went running through <laughs> pillaging farms, killing all the NPCs, and there was no reason not to. You kill people and <clears throat> take their stuff. What's wrong with that? Right? Right. And so Richard Garriott came up with this really elaborate, additive, moral virtue system that gaming really hasn't moved past since, you know, the idea of, he, he didn't go straight up um, Judeo-Christian cardinal virtues. He kind of came up with his own combos. Unfortunately, when, you know, Dragon Age Origins and, and certain Bioware games tried to pick up on that, they found their completion rates tank in their player base 
they got acquired by EA. EA said, you can't do that anymore. And so we have the dialogue wheel where it's just uh. Paragon, Renegade. And, you know, there's a little heart when you flirt. There's a little brain when you're going to say something thoughtful. And I don't find, I don't find myself engaging with those games the minute I know what, you know, oh, I'm going to be smart here. Oh, I'm going to be snarky here. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to flirt here. Um, the sexual harassment in later Bioware games is really bad. <laughs> you know, back yeah. you're, you're playing as everybody's boss. And it's like, hey, you want to hit it? Like, oh, uh, gosh. That was, that was pre me, too. That is why I, I, I just loved how Saints Row just took the piss yeah. out of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a great series, too. Saints Row. Oh, yeah. Um, so why did you guys like, how did you two end up working together? <laughs> uh the working together question uh it was sort of i think we we have a similar mentality about things and mm -hmm. then incredibly complementary skill sets so it's that sort of thing and we joke that we're basically the lutest twins from bioshock infinite i'm Rosalind <laughs> robert he's like yes. let's do the thing and i'm like hold on <laughs> um, <laughs> murder cage it doesn't matter but i like the cage you know i there's some of that there's some of a work style is really really important mm -hmm. in this business uh people can be absolutely brilliant but not have the same process and so it's an absolute disaster and they end up hating each other Right. We, we have complementary enough work styles. Uh, it's it's a bit of a challenge to add new people because we are so okay, let's go and do it. We do things so fast. Um uh, we we've had to sort of slow down and and again contain scope so we can do things in a smaller team. Um, if this game goes well, we're we'll have to learn um uh to to manage people but yeah i think that it's it just sort of happened i was doing mm -hmm. things and and i said to mary just hey we we could use this do you want to do it he's like okay it i, I think that's just pretty much what happened it, it was kind of jazz yeah the first thing that the first thing that we ever did together um i it was me writing uh, a, a musical number for boss fight um and then we, we did the uh, Sims parody before that. Oh yes, that. we did the Sims parody. That's <laughs> yeah, true. we did. Yeah. We did. We did the prayer. Um, the the uh, um, Sarah Brightman and and the guy about Shelley. Celine Dion. Um, it had to be Celine Dion. Celine, Celine Dion. Right. That's right. Celine Dion. We go. That horribly cheesy song. Yes. That everybody likes. I don't care who you say. And, and and Liana wrote Liana wrote lyrics for her in English and for me in Simlish instead of the Italian. And we did it at the end of Lady Bits because I beat the piss out of The Sims over and over and over and over and over, <laughs> and over again. And I wanted people to know it's just in good fun, right? And so we did this little Sims parody and um, Mary just went through and actually did, he made little avatars in The Sims and did a little video. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That That's was awesome. First, yeah, that was the first thing we, we did together. Um, I was way out of my comfort zone on that. Um, uh, being Canadian and singing Celine Dion in public <laughs> is... Oh, no. Yeah, you just... There's so many <laughs> reasons why you don't, but I'm a huge Steve Martin fan, and he writes in his, um, his autobiography, Born Standing Up, that he overcame those sort of inner barriers for him, where it's like, I can't play an instrument but i can play an instrument funny i can't sing but i can sing funny right and i took that i don't have to be celine dion i just have to get close enough to it <laughs> to give people a laugh right and that uh, that i i had a terrifying phobia of singing in public for years and years and years oh no um because of something that happened back in school um but that kind of got me over it and now if you've seen boss fight <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you wouldn't know mm -hmm. but i i kind of crap my pants every time i realize what i'm about to do um because the other thing that's funny about boss fight is i'm singing lead out of my range 
um my natural range is is Anne Reardon's not Princess Sparkle Muffins. Princess yeah, she's Sparkle a mezzo. Muffins. Oh, it's such it's such murder. Uh but it sounds cute at the end of it. I actually got a pretty interesting question. So what is better, making or playing the games? That's like oh. asking what's better, making food or eating food. <laughs> That's true. I I can't say. I mean, I had I love the, the the creative process, but I also love seeing what other people are doing. And when it's good, it's amazing. And then you go, I want to make something awesome too. I want to express, I want to create crazy things. So it's, I guess it's, I would say it's a dependent cycle for me. It's funny. I went for a similar metaphor, but mine was what's better sleep or sex. <laughs> <laughs> it did go for food or sex. Like how, how tired are you, right? Like playing a game that you feel really understands you rejuvenates you and makes you feel refreshed. Right. Um, but you know, taking more of a risk and that, that, you know, to me, sex is good when it's vulnerable. Um, uh, and so making games is very vulnerable because you're, you're putting a lot of yourself out there. Right. And then, uh, then asking people, Hey, fuck around with these characters we spent years making. Right. Um, they are different. I think that making games has given me a deeper and greater appreciation for what other people do when I play games, especially in the AAA space. AAA mm -hmm. games get so much crap, but those games, you know, those, those Ubisoft, you can make any game you want as long as it's an open world game with RPG elements. Those are still solid. They those are hard to make. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I'd want to make a game like that just because they are they are a lot of moving parts, right? You're you're talking about a massive, you know, um, uh, you know, galleon with a crew of of dozens instead of a cool little you know schooner that you can zip in and out. You know, mm -hmm. you get this little and it, it, totally different things, but. The more game dev jobs I do, the more I go back and play a game somebody else has made and just marvel at the stuff that they managed to pull off because you realize how hard it is. It's like opera. You know, opera is uh, a succession of things that somehow manage to fail to go wrong. Um, <laughs> or sometimes do. <laughs> or, or sometimes do as someone who has actually lost his pants in the middle of the scene. Oh my gosh. Um, or, or has or had to rescue a friend who was sliding into the pit because the paint the paint job was too slick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but yes, it's it's true. I mean, when you look at some of these old games, like there's a game that I guarantee no one here has played, which is called the, the Adventures of Robin Hood, and it was not the NES game. It was a DOS game that came out in, nine, in the 90s. Um, it was in the same style, the graphic style as Populous, but it was an open world uh, game, like one of the first real open world games uh, where there was no set storyline. You essentially were playing Robin Hood, and what happened was up to you. You could accidentally, which I did, murder Will Scarlet by shooting your bow at the, at the <laughs> wrong time. At uh, one point, I was trying to kill the Sheriff of Nottingham, and I ended up nailing Maid Marian right between the eyes. <laughs> um, it was just, and and of course, the game reacted. And then, you know, if you killed Maid Marian, then of course, the townspeople lynch you, and that's the end of the story. Um, or, you know, Ultima 7, which has so many moving parts. But the interesting part of all of that is that you're targeting things like emergent story, emergent mm -hmm. play, things that are not intended by the game developer, but you know, but the but the mechanics of the gameplay make it possible. Like there's an, an old Atari ST game called Sundog Frozen Legacy, which was an amazing game that has been completely obscured. Um, there's a there's a re, there's a remake called uh, Sundog Resurrection. You can look it up. It's actually uh, quite good. I'm one of the beta testers for that. Um, but for example, they had this, they had set up this entire spacefaring economy. The, the 
concept of that game is that you uh, you uh, were a mine worker who was, who's, gr whose rich uncle has just passed away and he's giving you the sun dog, which is his ship, which is a piece of crap and is falling apart, but it's your ticket to freedom uh, and you have to fulfill several contracts, etc. And one of the problems in the game is that anytime you do a trading contract, when you put cargo, you know, valuable cargo in your ship's hold and you go into space, you immediately get detected by space pirates who try to blast the hell out of you. Um, and, you know, early in the game, when you have like really low quality gear, you might survive, but like parts of your ship are falling apart and you have to spend more money into fixing it, etc. So that was the challenge. And then someone realized, you know, the worlds have different technology levels. Like the world when you start, is it's, it's a med tech level, but there's a, a, a very high tech world that is within the first jump reach. And if you go there and you stockpile a whole bunch of spare parts in your ship's cargo, they don't get to, in your ship's hold, they don't get detected as cargo by the pirates. So you can go to a high tech world, then go to a low tech world, sell off all of those spare parts and you start making money like crazy. And when the game designer heard about this, they asked him, well, you're going to patch that? And it's like, no, that's a perfect workaround. And it's an excellent mm -hmm. idea. Uh, and mm -hmm. the game mechanics allow for it. So why should I patch it out? Um, I actually have a question, another one from Robert. I, what is your opinion on if it is um, your choices matter type games, right? Um, are they actually possible or are they reduced mostly to selling points? You, you realize you're asking to like philosophy junkies to talk <laughs> about <laughs> choice and the oh. meaning of choice. Oh, this is get get drinks, everybody. <laughs> uh, Mary Jess, do you want to go first or should I tee up? Well, uh, <laughs> I'll go first, and then you can and then you can go. Well, right. I do think they're possible, but here's the thing. Um, Actually, I was talking about this with my husband the other day because we were talking about our game idea, uh, which Liana likes, but I'm not going to talk about it exactly because <laughs> we, we want it to be a yet. surprise. Yeah. We haven't announced it yet. Uh, it's going to be, of course, a couple of years because it'll have to happen after boss fight. But he was talking about the, the, the concept of choice in games. And um, there is, a, um, there is a, a, a programmer, legendary game designer, Chris Crawford, oh. who talks a lot about interactive storytelling. And um, we really like what he has to say, but there is a problem that we have with his ideas. Um, is And it, for him, the notion of interactive storytelling um, dovetails with emergent story, emergent gameplay. For him, for a story to be fully interactive, it needs to have no pre-written story, no pre-written plot points. And we thought, you know, that's not really, that does not create a satisfying uh, experience because one, we are not at the point of technology where we can create a system and and this and the computer can create a meaningful interaction with the trappings of human interaction. You know, you might get a mechanical, uh, you know, a, a scene being played out mechanically, but the the, the computer, the, the AIs, do not have the finesse to write, to handle language, to handle emotions, uh, and so we thought, you know. This is where we go back to the issue of your choice matter. Does your choice really matter? Does it not? Well, the idea is, some people have the idea that if you have a truly open world with, with nothing but emergent play, then you have absolute freedom of choice. There's a problem there, though. Uh, the first thing is that most people experience choice paralysis. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you are faced with an NPC and you have a system where you can say absolutely anything to that NPC, uh, you don't know what to say because there has been no contextual constraining. And here's the thing, um, and this goes back to discussions of what is freedom, et cetera. Um, you know, freedom as an abstraction, yeah, people go, oh, it's great, like ABBA said in their most recent song, uh, there are no memorable oaths to freedom. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason is that freedom needs to have a context. Mm -hmm. Choice needs to have a context. Uh, so you have to have a certain level of constraint for these choices to mean something. Um, you know, you need to have a cost, you need to have a consequence. And so when you look at the overall story, you have to design, if you want to have a design where your choice actually matters, you can, you have several approaches. You can have a, a game that will probably take you 10 years to finish, where you can factor in several different choice points and their, um, and their ramifications. Uh, and so, 
of course, it'll be incredibly expensive to implement unless you're going for, you know, uh, a low level adventure game, etc. But there's also another solution. You can have a level of choice that is different enough, that gives you a different enough experience that there is a significant impact on the gameplay, on the story, on the characters. Of course, the problem there is, you know, how different do you want to make it? That still goes into uh, how expensive that is going to be on the on the side of game development. Uh, so you can have a game. It's surprisingly, you can have a game where your choices do matter, even within a small scope. Mm -hmm. I encourage people. There's an, uh, another thing I adore is interactive fiction. Um, you know, these textile games from the Infocom era, but the genre has remained alive. It is constantly being produced. There's yearly competitions. One of the greatest um, uh, interactive fiction writers is Emily Short. And she wrote a very short, it's a one room uh, interactive fiction piece called Galatea, um, which is kind of a callback to the Pygmalion Galatea myth. Um, you are in an exhibition room and there is this statue, but she's sentient and she can talk to you. And depending on how you interact with her and the things that you say to her, whether you encourage her or whatever, you have different endings. Like you can, she, in one ending, she can, she steps off the pedestal and she leaves with you because she wants to be free. Um, so you have all of that in there that you can just pull off in one room. It is perfectly possible to extend that um, mm -hmm. to have, a, to, to, to the extent of a full game without having feature creep, without having, um, without having an overarching monster that that just collapses on itself with its own weight, it's just very difficult, and it it, it takes a very very good design mind, and probably a shit ton of charts <laughs> to pull it off. Yeah, and then expect you know when you go through the review process to have the people reviewing games not understand what you're doing, and that sort of. Um, there's a big difference between being most people who review games are like, I'm a writer because they write reviews or they make videos. They're, they're language <laughs> driven. And that's when you get into, what do you mean by choice? Mary just suffers through me doing this all the time. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, he just went this and, and Pygmalion and Galatea and all that stuff. And I'm like, Mer, what do you mean by choice? And what do you mean by matter? right because choice there are two types of choice in a game right reductively there's narrative choice and then there's gameplay choices right picking which weapon to use in a fight is a choice this is what i love about the far cry games i can storm a fort with a tiger buddy chucking meat so that the tiger eats the guy <laughs> i can use a rocket launcher i can go in loud i can go in quiet but when people review the games, they're, oh, the story's very linear. Yes, because the choices aren't in the narrative. They're in the gameplay. Mm -hmm. Those are still choices, right? You get into narrative choice, then you're into branching story. That's what most people see as choices matter. But that's not the only type of choice that matters. If you want truly emergent choice, then it has to be, all gameplay, because there's no narrative. It can't possibly be. You've got an infinite number of choices. It's the monkeys on the typewriters, right? But then even within narrative choices, you have to decide, and there's two competing irreconcilable philosophies in game design. There is no right or wrong here. There's one team that believes that choices must have consequences to matter. So there, there must be cause and effect. Otherwise, it's just sort of existentialist claptrap and sophistry and solipsism, and it, it doesn't mean anything, right? And then you've got other people who claim if there are consequences, then all you're doing is min-maxing. You're not actually making a choice based on a truly interactive experience because a truly interactive experience is all about how you feel about what happens. One is one is very kind of German philosophical. One is very French 
which is what happened with the original Watch Dogs and, and why they decided to make a game that was all about how you feel about this flat affect main character. Uh, good for them. They tried it. It didn't work in terms of audience, <laughs> um, audience response. But uh, the problem with the whole meaningful choice question is obviously, you know, game devs will talk and talk and talk and talk <laughs> about it but there's really no answer because there are numerous answers but it's hard to get a satisfying response to the question because the question is so ephemeral and so difficult to grasp yeah just because you have choice doesn't mean you have control just because you have autonomy doesn't mean you have agency and and so on and so forth and so you cannot possibly please everybody all of the time and, and that's where the design comes in you have to make a very clear decision very early on in your process what kind of choices are we going to have matter. I mean, in Bioshock, the design philosophy is, is very much, well, if there's a clear advantage to harvesting the little sisters or saving the little sisters, if there's a clear difference between the bird and the cage, then it's not really a choice. It's a strategy. Mm -hmm. That's what Bioshock comes down on. Obviously, Bioware games take a very, very, very different approach to the whole thing with, with the multiple endings. And, and I, I think that I go back to the Yakuza series, I think they they kind of do a really cool thing in that some, sure, some choices do matter in terms of, you know, your, your real estate empire or um, uh, some of the things that, that you do within the game that can get you really cool weapons or really cool items, make those later fights much, much easier. But then there are other things that just kind of happen and, and the, the meaning, what matters is that experience, right? When you go into the, the, the cabaret mini games and you talk to these hostess girls and you find out all their little personalities and their quirks and you see their stories, you don't get very much tangible out of that. I, I, I would fight to the death that those experiences matter because you've got these really cute, Asian hostess ladies with personalities who are individuals and you have to figure out what they like and what they don't like. And that's very meaningful in, you know, our discourse now. Right. Uh, so I, that was an incredibly long non answer. And I apologize <laughs> for that, but sometimes the most truthful answers are a repurposing of the question. Yeah, I like it. I, you know, I. It's so funny when you guys talk about this because I'm a normie gamer. I guess is the best way to put it. So, <laughs> so thinking about these things, I'm like, well, in uh, Detroit Become Human, I died a lot of times. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and like just thinking about the games that I haven't ever explored because I've never heard of half of these. Like, I, there's a lot of what you've mentioned I haven't even. Like, obviously, I love Bioshock. I love some of those games, but mm. those are AAA games. I've never really dug a whole lot deeper unless you're talking Undertale or something. And that kind of was a phenomenon in itself. I've never really dug deeper when it comes to the gaming industry besides the AAA. And I, I think... I think that's been a mistake all along. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not big on... If, if we have inspired you to try some stuff off the beaten path. I, I do think you'd like uh, the Unavowed games, the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Walking Dead games that, that oh, yes. you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but if people just want to stick to what they're familiar with, I think that's great. You know, people who only play the annual Call of Duty and the annual Madden and maybe, you know, some NBA 2K or, or, or whatever, that's a gamer. People yeah. who are like us who play these <laughs> <laughs> nutty baby, what what is this you're doing what with who and how i mean we got way into a game that's a retelling of hamlet from the point of view of ophelia only ophelia is a black lady in it uh what the heck was the name of that game mary Jess? oh um the the hamlet one right um 
Elsinore. Elsinore. That's right. It's called Elsinore. And it's a time loop. And, you know, the indie games are a deep well. And it you basically sort of go through word of mouth and what you mm -hmm. like. And right. if you like this, you try other things. And But people shouldn't feel like if they don't have the really nerdy deep dive <laughs> lore dump knowledge that we do because you know we do this stuff um that shouldn't make them feel less that shouldn't make them feel second class that shouldn't make them yeah. feel uh like they have less of a right to an opinion i think yeah. that's part of the problem with the industry is there's too much gatekeeping Oh, in yeah. that regard if somebody picks up a halo title and sees god fantastic <laughs> i i, I yeah. wonder about that god but um <laughs> you know that's great if somebody thinks uh i'm trying to think of a game there are people like cyberpunk they thought it was a yeah. heck of a time amazing right I hated The Last of Us 2. If people love The Last and of I Us 2. And I loved it. <laughs> yeah, see, if people love The Last of Us 2, that's that's good. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like I said about the choice answer, you cannot possibly get um, everybody right. in, yeah. in, in anything. Because there's too many binary choices you have to make as a designer. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing with comic books, right? Yeah. Right. Like if people just read big two comics and they they don't delve into some of the indie stuff or, you know, they're not like me who was obsessed with 90s Doom Patrol and all of a sudden that's <laughs> relevant instead of just friggin' weird. And, you know, um, it, it it is not better or worse. Hobbies and pop culture stuff should not be. I don't believe they should be identities. I certainly don't believe they should be jobs. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. at this point, there's just too much maintenance to be allowed to have an opinion on yeah. anything, you know. And and I I don't I certainly don't want any games for for that audience. Um, if the game comes out and major game reviewers utterly loathe what we did, I will cheer. <laughs> oh, I know. Gosh. Oh, I just have a question. Actually, oh. uh, aren't the what's it called? The oh my gosh, Tall Tale Games are they considered? Mm -hmm. uh, oh my gosh, we were just talking about this adventure game. But, I, yeah, adventure game. Oh, yes, adventure. Thank you. That is a very interesting question because. Oh, we're gonna get super polarizing now without without intending to be. You have Please games do. like that. You have games like Life is Strange. You have games like Gone Home, and you get into the. It's not a game because there's no gameplay in it. It's like, of course, there's gameplay. You are doing right. button inputs. There's no combat. There's there's very few puzzles, but there is gameplay, mm -hmm. and and. This is where you you start realizing that we we work and and play in an industry that is made up almost entirely of jargon. Um, the categorization issue is so I, I will say problematic. I never use that word, but in this case, it's not a problem, but it's a potential problem down the line. And again, I'll just. I'll give you guys a binary branch and then I'll throw it over to Mary Jess because he'll he'll have a a, a much more poetic um, take on this than <laughs> I would. I think you're seeing our different styles of thought, right? Like he weaves a yarn and I'm like system, 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 flowchart, right? <laughs> uh, a to B, B to C, split, if and clause. Um, but uh, you know, there is genre in everything else mystery comedy drama gothic right uh then there in games we have this other thing that people call genre that is actually ludo genre it is the type of game not the type of story mm -hmm. and i wish people would start calling them ludo genres because then you know fantasy genre rpg ludo genre and they're not the same thing. And too many game genres are getting locked into a particular, like if, if it's an RPG, we must have puffy shirts and elves and dwarves, right? No, can we please get a- uh, Anachronox? 
a, a noir detective RPG mm -hmm. or so they kind of tried with LA noir, but it was more open world. Um, Disco Elysium. Disco Elysium. Yeah. There's a shining example. It had, um, it had sort of magic realism elements to it, but yeah, there's a good example of something that sort of broke the mold. And that's why when we get into these classifications, these, um, categories are supposed to be means of communication not some sort of pass fail destiny thing mm -hmm. and i i when you're pitching a game when you're developing a game this is this is something that's really painful because if you can't do you know a comedy driven jrpg style mmo with adventure game elements people are like what is your game it's a game it's this here's a demo play the game right but that's not how the gaming industry works and i I'd, I'd, I'd like the industry to unclench its sphincter a little bit and that was a perfect liana landing mary just over to you to salvage the <laughs> class of this discussion try a little bit more flow you mean <laughs> <laughs> to flow okay, I'm gonna stop. I'm getting, I'm getting toilet humor again. Okay. Um, so th that's interesting. I, I do agree a lot with Liana's uh, response because I actually I remember, um, I remember back in the day, um, <laughs> a lot of the early Sierra Adventure games actually tried to mix it up. They tried to add arcade sequences to their games like if you there's a, here's a great adventure game called conquest of camelot which <laughs> was like the arcade uh, sequences are terrible yes yeah. written by christy marks uh you know her from the creator of gem and the holograms she wrote scripts for the ninja turtles um oh, yeah she, she also wrote amethyst in gem world mm -hmm. um uh so she, she's a very accomplished game designer screen um uh screenwriter so christy made i think the best portrayal of arthurian of the arthurian cycle on any game so far the game is wonderful however mm -hmm. sierra was experimenting you know they, they want they were going well you know we don't want to be fully you know fall, fall fully into the adventure game bracket we're going to add some some um some arcade elements some action elements and there's one element where you have to kill boars uh, that are attack wild boars that are attacking <laughs> you uh there's another one where you have to fight the dark knight the black knight and oh my god um there was one problem and it's that sierra kind of sucked at action implementation mm -hmm. uh so although the the concept of these gay of of these sec segments were interesting the execution was kind of terrible mm -hmm. uh but that didn't discourage sierra they kept at they kept adding at it i mean the quest for glory games had combat um the first game uh it, it started getting progressively better until you got to the quest for glory 4 where you had sliders where you could control how your character fought and defended mm -hmm. so you know it was much better uh but you know when you look at say um an adventure game like monkey island and you assume that 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 is the trope designer for the entire genre so you need to have silly puzzles you, have, you need to have no death you need to have no action sequences like the says, you're creating this framework that you're tying the type of story to the type of gameplay and that's not necessarily the case uh so for example some of the the, the telltale games uh i played mm -hmm. i played uh, the wolf among us um, and I thought oh, that so was good. brilliantly told uh -huh. um, story. Of course, later on, Telltale went down, you know, the pot. But um, even those games had the the quick time event uh, uh, moments where you had to react, or you know, you would get killed, or someone else would get killed, or someone would yell at you, etc. The Walking Dead game also had elements of that by Telltale. Um, so. I don't, I would, you know, I would consider them adventure games regardless of how, of how um, the mechanical trappings of the game mm -hmm. mechanics appear. Because when we're talking about genres, you have, you have the Ludo genres, which is, of course, you know, how the game handles, etc. Mm -hmm. But you also have the type of story that's being told. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have, you can have an adventure story and an adventure story uh, focuses on exploration, meeting new people, fixing shit that's broken, and then, you know, 
ideally saving the day, potentially. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. what you focus on in an adventure story, the exploration thing. Whether you do that through an action, you know, through action elements, etc., that's that's not the, the the core element to the story. That is that is the mechanical genre. Um, but you know, you can have a, a platformer. You know, the, the 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 platformer, the platforming part is the mechanics. But you have a story that deals with with adventure, with exploration. Uh, a great game that does this is uh, oh my god, I want to say Iconoclasts, but I might be completely uh, off the rails. I have it on my Steam library, but um, it but it does things of that sort. Uh, you know, an RPG, role playing game. Yes, you're in, you're embodying a character, and you do that through both choices that you have with other characters as well as the stats. That your character mm -hmm. increases. How you do that? You know, are you going to do it as a turn-based RPG? You can have, you can you can have an act uh, an action adventure RPG. You can have card-based RPG. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Liana is spot on. There there needs to be a distinction between what type of story are you telling and the 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 mechanical or mechanistic genre that is being used. And those don't need to be tied together. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you mentioned fables. Fables was fantastic. Yes, I would. Uh, then, I, that the the comic or the game. I just want well, to be clear. Well, the game. Yeah. The thing about, I mean, fables, the, fable. This is an example of a game. The whole idea was to take um, a fantasy action RPG and basically make it one button combat combat to get around that issue of. Um, barriers to entry i mean we we went through this with the boss fight game and we were deciding between straight up turn-based and more of an atb style system we tried the atb for a while and we want this to be something that you know someone like you can play tristan who isn't aware of these classic games and get a sense of it and the minute you're getting into quasi turn-based quasi action you've got kind of these action windows it's too confusing mm -hmm. uh, when there's so many other things going on. We want people mm -hmm. focusing on what kind of poo the unicorn throws at the enemy, right? Or what, what kind of fun combination of moves you can do so you can get a bit of a giggle out of your combat experience as well as, you know, d defeat, defeat the bad guys. Um, but yeah, it's, it's again, um people shit on fable when it came out i was really surprised i think they did oh, a great wow. job it's it's a game series that has uh, first of all it was on the original xbox and xbox's right. golden era was the 360 generation so it at that point it was cool to you know oh ps2 is awesome and then shit on xbox because it right. was it was new uh, it was an RPG on console, which some purists had issues with. I thought it did what it did really, really, really well. But I think back to those games and how poorly they were received. And now to hear people speak so fondly of them, I kind of sit back and go, hey, 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 to all <laughs> the people who had their noses in the air back in the day. Because that's a critic standpoint, right? That's not a creator right. standpoint. And they are very, very different places. Um, one of my favorite games of the PS3 era got the shit kicked out of it, uh, Heavenly Sword. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I mean, yeah, it was short because they couldn't fit any more on the physical disc. <laughs> that was oh my all gosh. they could do because of the the motion capture sequences mm -hmm. uh and so it was designed to be replayed but it was no too short seven out of ten they judged what wasn't there instead of what was there and, and fable right. was very similar people wanted the what and, and here we go meaning again i think we found the the uh, what does meaning mean theme <laughs> of the stream uh but you know, they wanted more meaningful combat. They didn't want to do sword, 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 arrow, 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 magic, magic, magic. Like right. Fable did, right? They missed the point that <laughs> the whole point of Fable is button, 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 button. I know exactly what to do here. I'm not 
thinking, what spell do I use? What thing, what, what weapon, what is this with stances and, you know, hotkeys and all that stuff? It was simple. And then you could select to run around and have people call you arse face. And, and chicken chaser. And chicken chaser yeah. and, a, and a bunch of other things. I don't know if anybody who did the heroic things, it was always arse face and chicken chaser because <laughs> that was fun. But this is where I get into the whole review process and, and the issues that the industry has in terms of, again, a gatekeeping. Um, you get people who don't understand the game they're playing, which right. anybody who does anything in art... Art criticism is subjective. Mary Justin and I were going, how, Guardian, why, what about giving <laughs> the ABBA Voyage three stars out of five? Like, how? How do you not either love or hate that album? How do you go, it was just meh, right? But this is the problem with art criticism. It's subjective. And, and this reviewer at The Guardian just did not get it. And you get, I mean, there's so much more to not get uh, with um uh video games somebody mentioned eternal darkness sanity's requiem in chat brilliant brilliant game on completely the wrong system mm -hmm. for for it to have caught on if that had been a playstation game it would have blown up and been amazing but it was on like the gamecube or something like that it was an m-rated game on a nintendo system when that wasn't happening and there are these really unfair things in terms of receptions to games and i know it <sighs> crunch is bad and uh you know <laughs> thank you for the sound effect <laughs> was crunch. That, was, that was perfect uh, cr crunch, crunch, crunch. uh but uh, oh, you know sorry. crunch is really bad and poor poor pay and all that stuff gatekeeping and hiring but the utterly shit heel reception that perfectly good games get is something mm -hmm. that we're not allowed to talk about because oh boy harassment but it's true of any of any nerd thing right i mean everybody's got very strong feelings about the eternals right now and i'm sort oh of yeah like, i'm gonna sit in a hole and i'll wait until it's out on, you know, Disney Plus or something. Because I don't want to have that fight. Because I'm tired of those fights. Mm -hmm. And um, well, nobody has you know, time for that. Well, some people do. And to make. That's, <laughs> that, that's fine if that's their idea of fun. Fighting on the internet about things, cool. But you know, um, yeah. There's I I prefer to focus on stuff I like, which is why we're making yeah. a game about kindness and friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, kindness and friendship doesn't mean the game's going to be soft. It, it doesn't mean there aren't going to be snarky lines and, and dark, you know, dark moments, poignant moments. Um, but yeah, it's just so, again, these things should not be identity. They should not be jobs. They shouldn't be full-time commitments. And yeah, people are making money off off those fights and and you know i'll go one i'll go one step further and say people aren't just making money off the fights they're making money beating up on you know other youtubers over those fights and that's mm -hmm. that's not right and that tone that example is being set by the enthusiast press to the point that the that enthusiast press has now become a punchline uh they dropped it in doom in the most recent doom patrol episode of the enthusiast press and i'm like okay that is a very funny throwaway line uh but we, we need to do something about the tone in the industry and it's it's not gonna be web-based journalism it's not going to be online journalism that does it because everything's driven by by uh clicks mm -hmm. right? right it's Revenue. gonna have to be the community and it's gonna have to be the development community and, and the gaming community that do it and that was part of the reason we decided to do this because i felt like i'd done all i could with videos about games it was time to just sort of make a game and go here it is right think i suck hate me if you want i don't care i made something with the intent of people enjoying it and 
there is nothing not good intentioned about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like and Alice the, said, what's the worst that could happen? We'd be last. <laughs> yeah, nobody plays yeah. it is the worst thing that could happen as far yeah. as that. nobody playing it is worse than people hating it to me. Well, when I, you know, I didn't even ask. When do you, I, I? I looked on the the actual Kickstarter. Do you have a set date that you think it's going to be finished, or is that kind of in the air right now? We're aiming for 2023. We're doing the Doom marketing model of we're going to be putting out like a six to ten hour experience so okay. that people can sample it. Because I mean, one of the commitments of these games is the sheer hours, right? Uh, that they have so we're gonna have uh three or four it's the it's the western to southern quarter of the map that uh people are going to be able to explore and have a complete experience it tells a complete story with a resolution but it's basically gonna be a demo mm -hmm. um that people can try it and go do i like this kind of game uh, is this something I find fun? It's a sampler that people can, you know, binge in an evening or play it over the weekend. We believe that if people give this a chance, um, they will like it. They will have fun. They will find it accessible in, in numerous, numerous ways, not only from, a, you know, a, a, a disability standpoint, but also in terms of the gameplay being very pick up and play. Uh, but yeah, we, we want, so that'll, we're aiming for 2023. We wanted to give ourselves a lot of time because it's better to be early than late. Um, and then the complete experience will be coming out after that. Um, how much later will depend on things like funding and things like how big we end up going. The development's very modular. So, um, it, it, you know, it's uh, that that's that's a very long answer. Sort of explaining the right. answer. Twenty twenty three. Uh, that's what we're that's what we're aiming for. That's not that bad. Like we, a lot of times when you look at these things, that's we're nearly away a year away from that. I mean, I know I understand you've got twelve months in that year, but that's really not that bad. Like I because I have no idea what goes into making a game, none whatsoever. How much actual you're talking about a six to 10 hour game. How much actual man hours is that? Oh, a lot because of all the, you know, what, what we call uh, like pre pre production, uh, all the character development, all the assets, all that stuff. The nice thing about RPG maker is it's much faster than mm -hmm. having to, you know, get stuff from the Unity store and then customize everything because nobody likes, you know, just straight up Unity assets. Unity is a funny thing because it's become this industry standard thing and it is not user friendly at all. At, oh, no. At all. Uh, it takes a long time, but it's it's free ish. Right. With Unity. But that's the nice thing about doing RPG Maker is stuff comes together relatively fast and we're using things uh, you know one of the benefits of rpg maker is that it uses a tile set base a map system uh, which is you know it's it's kind of like a puzzle you put things together mm -hmm. um and we are starting we have purchased uh, a pre-made tile set an asset pack that i have been modifying uh you know the, mm -hmm. all of the characters have been created the, or the main characters their sprites were created by me um but we have you know several npc templates we have etc and i'm going to be modifying them and creating my, our own as well but it's good to have something and uh, it has its own distinctive look we went for something that looked like a 16-bit uh, game like chrono trigger yeah um uh, because we really like that aesthetic and it's a lot it's a lot easier to make uh, those assets than say sculpting 3d uh models things of that sort mm -hmm. yes yes and i and i got another good question for you liana what's more stressful making a live action web series or an indie game oh the web series <laughs> oh really i didn't hair expect and that makeup. hair makeup and wardrobe man fuck that <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst part that's the writing it and, and 
everything like that, that's one thing, but oh, am I going to wake up today and my hands don't work, my vision's blurred and I'm swelled up like a blimp. That's stress, man, because that is completely out of mm -hmm. any control. Relatable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like when, when you deal with uh, cro chronic illnesses and stuff like that. When, let's not talk, know, not talk about the uh, uh, editing afterwards where you were playing four characters at the same time and you were dealing with Premiere crashing constantly. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. it, so <laughs> many layers. So much green screen. It it's a great reel now, right? I mean, one of the things I wanted to do with Boss Fight is I started in television and I, before that I was in theater and it had been years since I'd been able to play characters anywhere anybody could see it. And there was an entire group of people that didn't know I, I did that. And it, it actually, people, people kind of rebelled to get it. They were angry at me for the characters at first. And, and <laughs> oh my goodness. Think, oh, so much. That's cringe. That's cringe. And I'm like, please, <laughs> please conjugate if you're going to insult me. Right. But, but it's the uh, good cringe. It's it's the good. It's, it's cringe worthy. Give me the back half of the word. I'm a language. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was what bothered me about it. Not that they were insulting me, but they were doing it inarticulately. Right. I, I, I get that the whole slang and, and I, I just, I, uh, I'm a purist, but yeah, it, so yeah, you get these characters and maybe part of the reason this is easier is I'm not doing it almost mostly on my own. We're, we're delegating a lot more. There's a cool back and forth and, and sharing. And it's, it's one of the times that group work hasn't sucked. Uh, there, there's been, there's been stresses, there's been challenges, there's been, um, you know, some dead ends and stuff that didn't, totally work but in terms of the kind of stress i like i much prefer the stress of trying to make something work i like implementation stresses not youtube drama stress and so it, it's nice to sort of well yes here we are on youtube but um you know that whole Thing. I mean, I guess I've sort of ripped the Band-Aid off in the stress of how are people going to react to Social Justice Warrior? How are people going to react to a twerking furry, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so those reactions are pretty funny. The reactions to the twerking pony were, were pretty funny. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I sounded like just, there. Just wait until Just wait until they see the higher resolution um, battlers doing that. <laughs> Oh, we may have to put in a twerk. I don't know. Yeah. You'd have to put in a twerk. <laughs> <laughs> He's already squatting. Maybe we can adapt it to a twerk. I don't know. But there's so much charge behind twerking that I, I, I don't twerk as myself. Clearly, I can twerk, but I don't I don't partake of the twerk. <laughs> I would do an occasional whine. Um, no head top and no twerk. Okay. <laughs> I was very struck Bianca's laughing. But, you know, for something like Princess Barco Pony, who is just, she was created to be the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, I love that. Yet being able to do that weird Grant Morrison on a moderate amount of drug stuff, that's a lot of fun. But the physical strain of doing that stuff, like those, some of those costumes are very hard on the body. The, oh, I the, bet. Shao, the Shao Kind suit is fur with rubber and more fur and feet twice the size of my feet and these big extended <laughs> hands and limited vision and three wigs. And there is a physicality that with, uh, with a video game, it's like, Hey, it's animated. And, and yes, voice acting is, uh, is a strain in its own right. Um, I'm, I've, I've been struggling with vocal stuff since um, late August, but Doing the free. voices, yeah. Doing the voices are is a heck of a lot easier than. It's a different challenge 
but it's so frustrating when you get a piece of footage and it's like, oh, if I just held that an extra couple seconds, if my eye line had just been an inch higher, things like that, making sure the heights are consistent with the different characters, that is a stress I am not going to miss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't blame you. There, um, is, I don't know if you answered this or not, but is Glowy Box going to be in the game? Glowy Box is. They are. Glowy Box is going to be in the game. Yes. Glowy Box okay. is a meaningful is a meaningful part of the game. Gl Glowy Box was a complete accident, too. Have I ever told you guys the story of Glowy Box? No, I I don't think I yeah. sorry, I had to I had to mute it. I was coughing. I my allergies are terrible. Um, but um no. Yeah, boss uh Glowy Box came from Lady Bits. And I did an episode zero because there was I mean, Lady Bits was its own kind of drama, but I did a what this show is and what this show isn't. And in the comics, people kept saying they were staring at the glowy box. What is that glowy box? And I was like, <laughs> what the hell's a glowy box? <laughs> and somebody finally said, it's that coffee table next to you. So, oh, and and this is the way I think if if they've named it, well, now it's not an it. Now glowy box is alive. <laughs> and so what is glowy box who is glowy box why is glowy box uh we got very french uh, <laughs> and glowy box because it was three kind of those translucent drawers with one of those exterior christmas lights shoved in i'm like okay it's three drawers so they're a collective consciousness so glowy box has a they pronoun we're going there that that is is glowy box and, and glowy box is the center of power because glowy box must clearly be a very powerful being if this <laughs> fucking light box self-actualized on me right next to me without me noticing <laughs> that's, that's where glowy box came from the fucker self-actualized <laughs> if you can make a glowy box work like uh grant Ma morrison made a a, a non-binary street work you're good like you've made it in life <laughs> i don't know I love this it. was a bigger swing to me than danny the street <laughs> I, I, I think i think glowy box and danny the street hang out during the weekends i i think <laughs> that's the thing there is definitely a well, princess sparkle pony is is right in there with with danny the street right i mean i mean those two are are very um uh oh the glowy box sting that's a that's a coral uh the the actual glowy box music is oh it's very uh slow and but i just sped it up like to uh you know 250 percent, and so it sounds like it just Ooh. crashing right like da -da 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 -da, <laughs> and it just works so well so we'll oh probably have stings like that but and glowy box is in the game and it has it and they have their own sting yes Gl glowy box glowy box has a has an actual function yes in the game we're, we're trying to make people's roles we're gamifying video is interesting because it's not just oh we can throw this character in and be funny how are they actually useful how can you actually interact with them in a way that's going to make sense mm -hmm. and because they were all gaming tropes to begin with that wasn't that hard the one that sort of i think exploded on us was ann reardon yes uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh she demanded her own number i mean it just kept growing and growing and growing in the involvement of that character. I think just because as it, it sort of occupies the same space when you watch it as um, uh, what's it? Mona from Schitt's Creek, like the, the Catherine O'Hara character, just so over the top, the sort of Cruella de Vil type uh, thing. Uh, see, see what I mean? The glowy box go right right for it and people are like what's glowy box i'm like i finally asked what's glowy box okay okay glowy box demands your attention yeah Glo glowy, <laughs> box is, uh, glowy box is a uh is an extrovert and oh i'm my not gosh. <laughs> that's too funny okay so before we wrap up here um one last little push why do you think everyone or you know what give everyone a good reason to back this Oh, Besides, Thea yeah, said it's going to be awesome. <laughs> you're, you're, you're better. You're better at this than than I am, Mary. Just you do it. I am. <laughs> All right, we're, we're both, we're like, um. Okay. I'll I'll answer this in a in a in a sentimental kind of way. Um. 
back it because it's fun back it because you'll have a little piece of yourself because anytime you back the, the crowdfund you back the kickstarter it's an npc you you get to have your character in the game and what we hope this whole experiment does is people will be able to get it and and see themselves in in the game and go i matter just a little bit i'm real i'm not somebody who can just be canceled by a twitter mob i'm not somebody who can not exist i'm here it's planting a flag it's sort of that basic human thing to we go back to it to have meaning to matter uh and that that sounds very um cheesy and model and overwrought but that was definitely one thing i had as somebody who's been you know modeled in video games and had a dc comics character based on me and and all that stuff um it does make you feel different it does make you feel like you're less than nothing and so i wanted to share that experience for people who don't have an abnormal hip to waist ratio and giant boobs and i, I finally it. made it not saccharine at the end go me <laughs> yeah and yeah. you know we're a gener both of us grew up on games like i don't know if, if nobody has played this game Consider and adding it to your uh, to your playlist because it's one of the greatest JRPGs ever, Chrono Trigger. Mm -hmm. um, so that game, for example, had a totally bizarre cast. It had really wacky storylines. I mean, you're carousing back and forth through time, screwing th everything up, fixing everything up. But what people remember about Chrono Trigger is the campfire scenes when the characters mm -hmm. are sharing a moment. They're talking to each other. They're 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 vastly very different people but they're coming together and they're sharing something that's actually meaningful. And that's kind of a lot of what pushes us towards gaming. We want to give that experience. We want to create things that can give that experience to people. And um, earlier you said, um, you said something, uh, Tristan, that you felt like, for example, because you didn't know all of these, these obscure things you know, that you felt, you know, kind of bad. Well, you don't have to. Here's the thing. And the thing about gaming is that gaming is for everyone. There's mm -hmm. games all over the place. There's games in the past. There's games in the present. And you shouldn't feel like it's your task to learn everything. Mm -hmm. It's fun to learn things. And, you know, if you ever want to discover the past of gaming and, you know, the really incredible, important games that, you know, shaped things are, that's totally fine, but you don't have to. Yeah. Um, like, for example, if you want to know about the history of computer, of RPGs, you know, like Ultima, there's a great book called Desktop and Dungeons. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a CRPG book project, which is free. And uh, oh, wow. there's, there's also uh, an uh, uh, for the graphic adventures, there's something called hard, uh, Hardcore Gaming 101.net presents the guide to classic graphic adventures. So all of that is there for you to discover if you ever want to. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the joy of discovery is that you go, holy crap, there's all of these games that I haven't played yet, that I could play yet. And that is exciting because you know what that means? That means your play playlist is never going to be empty. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, people, yeah. You know, if people use this as a jumping off point of now, I think I understand this. I'll go and play one of these older games, which do sort of have sort of barriers. Um, it's weird. There's been sort of a comment censorship issue in the chat. And that's too bad. Sort of talks about what I was saying of people feeling like they matter. Comment didn't get censored for me. That's what's so weird. But mm -hmm. uh yeah, um, if people feel less intimidated to step off kind of the Xbox, PlayStation beaten path here, that's great. Because there is a whole new world. Um, <laughs> uh, but accessing it can be a challenge and you end up sampling a lot and not finishing and sampling a lot and not finishing and it can get really discouraging. So that's another thing, hopefully by building a dialogue and building a discussion around these games, we can, you know, expose people to this, this older stuff. Um, there's a succubus in the game. She's big on exposure. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, as you can see where my sense of humor is going to go with this game. I mean, but, so as Mao's, you've seen his armor. 
Yes. Uh, <laughs> Miles, Miles's armor for me is a, is a, is a Planescape Torment um, thing with Anna's armor. And the reason I got kicked out of my first ever girl gaming group, because I was, oh, I was um, defending this uh, uh, scantily clad redheaded tiefling character in, in like strappy leather armor voiced by Sheena Easton, but there's no stretch fabrics in in you know medievalist fantasy but they threw me out because i thought cool scottish stabby stabby tiefling rogue in cool leather outfit better than thought hooker i woman oh, draw yeah. and, and mouse's armor is leather and revealing and there's there's a banana hammock and there's chaps you know that's the closest i can get to eating a banana i can't so um <laughs> The actual food. Make that as dirty as you like, but it's not accurate. Let's be as a boob. Yeah, this, you, you see the different characters coming out when I, I start talking and getting punchy and don't realize that this is in public. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I mean, let's just... I think a big thing that we were doing, Mary Justin and I, is we're like, let's just cut the shit with this stuff. We, we are both so sick of all the turf wars and the culture wars and there's no reason that something that can't have people that don't you know look their skin's a shade of beige right they can be included without it being this super serious we must all be good people and have absolutely no fun message yeah. and i don't like the fact that uh del because because one of the things fantasy hasn't done, I think, is delved into those really cool non-European cultures, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, stuff with Latin American carnival or there's there's a lot of, I mean, it's a, it's a Zulu headpiece. It's a Bindi is a, is a Zulu name, Um things like that different cultures you know some um south asian stuff some uh indian subcontinent not enough of that has gotten into fantasy and it's like this weird continuation of colonialism now of course we're not going to go we're gonna lecture you about the evils of colonialism we're just gonna present characters and say we think this is cool we hope you do too and that's you know, that's the way to do it, right? You don't beat yeah. people over the head with things. Exactly. I love it. So make sure you guys check it out. I do have it pinned in the comment and also in the description. Also, Liana, if you're unaware, I doubt, but she does have a channel that she posts videos all the time. I, I, I'll say it again. I, my favorite segments are always the wellness Wednesday. I love them because I love to get a different perspective of, just mental health. Nobody talks about mental health, right? And, and it's such a great thing. So make sure you guys are subscribed to her. Make sure you guys check it out. Anything else you guys want to add? Uh, me and Bianca do have a video coming out tomorrow where we do the best comic pitches ever. <laughs> so make sure you guys check that out. And, and I don't want to miss anything. So is there anything you guys want to go ahead and add? Am I missing? Very just. I think I've made enough dirty jokes for one stream. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good. Awesome. Bianca? Uh, Robert did ask a question. Are you guys going to be doing uh, voice actors? And if you are, are, are they going to be YouTubers or professionals? Uh, we haven't announced anything involving voice cast. One of the things about this crowdfund is... Uh, depending on how much money we make will determine what we're going to be able to afford. Mm, awesome. Nice. Yeah. So that that's, we, we have some people in mind. We've had some people say yes. Uh, but you know, pros are they're professionals and they need to get paid. Right. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a big part of where the money's going. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Oh, so well, they are professionals. Yes. Oh yeah, I mean, okay. nice. I mean, refine, okay, so sorry. Again, <laughs> again, define professional, right? Uh, somebody, somebody with no experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there will probably be a few of them. 
uh, just because I find somebody hilarious and come, come record this. And, and then, and then, uh, then we're off to the races. Uh, the, the, the young man who I can't say the young man who plays the boy in episode three will be reprising his part because his, you know, his dad said he thinks he'd be very hurt. When I asked him, I was like, do you think he could do it? He says, I think he'd be very hurt if anybody else did it. Oh, so he's, he's he's very very excited that he's a video game character. That's awesome! Oh, that's so cute. You're gonna be very strict I love it. with them. No, you have to say it like this. Show some emotion, <laughs> kid. Oh, no, it, it's not possible. The blooper reel on that kid is legendary. He was such an ad libber. We're gonna have to put placeholder dialogue for him and then rewrite it once he's done because the kid yeah. is a natural. That, nice. That guy. He 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 knew how to ham it up just absolutely perfectly he needed no coaching but there was no reining him in either <laughs> that's so cute though yeah. i love it he, he was he was great um and it's a nice leavening with sjw's sjw-ness <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I love it. So make sure you guys check that out. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.